right in front of this house. See how this got to see if they there. I found over 560 unexploded projectiles so far, and uh, I still use the old World War II mine detector, which is not very good on buckles or buttons or non-ferrous metals, but it'll really find iron better than any of them, and it's very stable. So I've used the same detector all these years. Oh, can't tell where this stuff is going to show up. It's really almost where you find it uh, today. You go into all sorts of places. Sometimes uh, there are subdivisions and people's backyards. And of course, it's, it's much better to get permission to look, if you can, because when they find you, it's a lot better for them to ask you how you're doing than what you're doing. <laughs> she said no. Can't look? I'll be done. Uh, do you know, uh, we, we want to dig around on the other side. How far do y'all own down there? Do you own all the way to the other side? We, we don't want to get in dig up any flowers, anything like that. You not only have to have a lot of patience in relic hunting, but you also have to have a lot of patience in getting permission to finding who owns what. You have to continuously adjust the gain on these detectors to keep them nulled down as you run into different types of soil. I don't know exactly why I got interested in the artillery projectiles. They just seemed to be something that fascinated me. Uh, and I, I I can't tell you why it was, but they, they just did and they still do. And the more you find out about them, the more fascinating they become. I guess I started about uh, 18 years ago, I went through Louisiana State on track scholarship. And uh, track doesn't have a great carryover value, so uh, I just decided to, you know, get into something, something else. So uh, my daddy owned a farm out on the other side of the Chattahoochee River, and we used to pick up projectiles after rains and so forth. So I had a whole box of these at home. And my mother was cleaning out my closet one day and she said, come over here and get these things. So I went home and got them and uh, set up a little display. This federal shell hit be right behind a big Confederate infantry fort. And if it had blown up, it would have killed several people, but it evidently hit a rock, and when it did, the shell broke and drove this brass percussion fuse back down in it and bent it where the, where the striker couldn't run forward. And we found all this in the same hole. But this was a lucky break for those Confederates that were in that infantry fort. You know, if you lose something up here, it can come just rolling right down in there. That's a lot of tin cans to throw with it. <laughs> but uh, let's just give it a try and see. This is a, what we call a wall wall. This is a pine with a Confederate, uh, the back end of a Confederate archer projectile embedded in it. It's pretty well termite eaten. I think it's been sitting in somebody's garage for a long time. Fragment sound. Or The first part of the war, the English tried to help out the Confederacy, and they imported the Whitworth gun, which fired these flat-sided projectiles. And you can see the workmanship on this, how beautiful it is. It was 
made in England, of course. And when the blockade cut off the supply of these projectiles, the Confederates tried to make them. And here's the Confederate Whitworth. And as you can see, the workmanship on it, as compared with the English one, is leaves quite a bit to be desired. Okay, I think we might have something here. The Federals used some body armor. It was, it was never government issued, but they could buy it if they wanted to. A mini ball hitting anywhere in here would go right through this, so they really didn't do all that much good. Up here are uh, projectiles that have exploded in the ground, and we were uh, able to get the pieces and glue them back together. Now, these pieces here that are missing usually blow out of the ground, and you don't ever get those. Here's one we did find all the pieces to, though. And uh, it blew up, and it, it was about maybe a foot under. And uh, all the pieces to the shell, including the fuse, were right there. Getting the collection of Civil War projectiles, you also find that you end up with a lot of non-projectiles. Uh, for instance, this was in a museum for years and years as a Confederate projectile. That happens to be a fence post top. And also, every now and then, you run into a fake shell. This is a fake British Blakely shell, the type that the Confederates were using. But this had just been recently turned out of bar stock. I think we're right at Collier Road. And it's all built up now, but uh, it's right in the middle of the Battle of Peachtree Creek. In fact, we're coming up on some Union trenches right now at the Battle of Peachtree Creek in this fellow's yard right here. Well, you see that plaque. clean this lot off. We came out here and you could really tell something was going on. There was hundreds of fired mini balls, a lot of shell fragments, a lot of canister shot, some gun parts. I would say that probably uh, five or six hundred people were killed in this area here during the battle. Sure is. Uh, you think it's worth it? Yeah, I think it is. When you really hit it, sometimes I wonder when you go for about an hour without a signal. <laughs> the story I'm about to tell you now is really fantastic. About 10 years ago, when they were building I-75 and I-85 through downtown Atlanta, they went under Decatur Street in about a 40-foot cut. And when they hit the bottom of the cut, they hit a big cache of Confederate ordnance. And this came out of the, of the well with the ordnance. Now, what I think this is, is part of, the, of a charred building which was burned during the burning of Atlanta. Now, I know that sounds crazy but everything we got out of there was in a perfect state of preservation, and it was 40 feet down in the ground. So I'm convinced in my own mind that that's exactly what this is from. You know, the, most Southerners are very proud of the showing the South made, or the Confederacy made during the Civil War. And 
we live down here, well, is to place. And uh, when you find something from the, uh, from the war, you, you feel a close connection with it. It gives you a thrill. And you know I've done a lot of relic hunting up here on the ridge. Just wanted to get your permission to go back there. You think it'd be all right? I think so. We're hunting for Civil War bum shells. A five-inch shell, oh my gosh, it'd kill a lot of people if it hit anywhere around them. In the foreground is a 13-inch mortar shell and then the largest shell that was really fired in combat during the war, which is a 15-inch shell. They tell me when you built those two houses that uh, when the bulldozer knocked down that work, you found so many shells, the bulldozer operator wouldn't operate anymore. <laughs> Is that right? I'd always no, heard that really story. Right. I don't think that was right. <laughs> you know where no. the old trenches is at? Oh, yeah. Very well. Now, he's got maps of where they are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, we'll go on up there, and if we find any money, it's yours, but I have to warn you that in... in in 17 years of looking, I've only found 35 cents. <laughs> well, I don't think you'll find too much money. <laughs> okay. That's right. Uh. After the war, the federal grave registration came to these battlefields, and every federal grave they could uh, identify, they dug the fella up and put him in a federal uh, national cemetery, but they didn't do that to the Confederate dead, and so most of them that you find really uh, are the Confederates, uh, and they're usually in very shallow graves on a battlefield. I wish I could get a good signal for y'all, but I think we're going to have to wait until we get to Coosahatchee before we really start finding the entire projectiles. But there we really will find it. I mean, here's where we're going. Okay, this is the Civil War map of the area, and this is a modern topo map. This place is at Coosahatchee, South Carolina, which is about 45 miles above Savannah, Georgia, right on the Coosahatchee River. The Federals caught a troop train on the track down there, and some people got injured from shots, but uh, uh, they didn't have any great uh, uh, land battle there. It was mostly artillery. So I think we're going to find it this time. All the obvious battlefields have been beaten flat. There's nothing left. Uh, uh, any work that's by the side of the road has got a plaque there saying that such and such happened there. 500 or 1,000 relic hunters have already been over the spot. So we've got to go to these little known battles in the way out in the boondocks that are hard to get to that just the average weekend relic hunter is not going to go to. All right, we're now at the side of the Coosahatchee Bridge, which was shelled so heavily by the Federals. And uh, this is exactly the same railroad that was here during the Civil War. Now, over here, this is the patch of woods where the overshots are going to be. That's where we, we've got to go across this swamp here and across two bayous to get to it. We've been doing a lot of talking, now we've got to produce. You know, you do this research and on a battle and, and you know this stuff is there. So you might drive three or four hundred miles to this spot and all this is fun getting there. And then you might not find anything, but still you've had a great time doing it and, and a lot of times you really hit it. You're in, rattlesnake country there. in fact, I'm excited about going to Tusahatchee because I think we're going to find something. We are anticipating finding something down there. Uh, my face would really be red if we got down there and didn't find anything, but it would still be a great trip of us going down there and uh, going out in the woods and building up a good appetite. You know, a lot of these relic hunters tell me, they say, well, boy, what we ought to have is a camper, and we could live right there on the battlefield. And I say, hell no, that's not what I want. 
one of the best things about relic hunting is getting out of the woods and after it's all over and getting a good shower and going off and getting a good meal somewhere. <laughs> we're going to have a lot of fun, you know, even if we don't find something, but we're going to find something. I guarantee we're going to find something. We got lost one time and it was, uh, it was almost about sundown and finally one of the boys said, well, look, let's just figure the opposite direction, the way we shouldn't walk. So we took off in that direction and came out within about 100 yards of the automobile. <laughs> other people in the woods which you want to know about. It's, it's just a good idea to, to have one ear open. But you can't press in trying to find this stuff. You got to, you know, you, you find a lot more if you just sort of take it easy and go along just steadily, but you can only do it for so long and then you have to sort of rest. A fragment, uh, maybe a shell. Oh. Now this sounds good because you can even hear it this high above the ground. Now we see if we can pinpoint it. It should be right there. hit it, whatever it was. Looks like a shell, all right. <laughs> oh, boy. Looks like we... Twelve pound Napoleon. Let's see. It's a Bowman. It's an explosive shell. I can tell by the weight of it. So we can uh, knock some of the stuff off of it. And see where the fuse is. The fuse is under there somewhere. We might mess it up if we go after it so far, but uh, see they're back here. I knew they were back here. Those are pretty good shells to have. They are, they are all right. That, the Bowman fuse will probably come out pretty good on that one. Tom, how many of these shells would be fused? Oh gosh, I've fused maybe 50 or 60 shells. This is a hundred pound of Federal Navy shinkle projectile, which I think we can diffuse without blowing everybody into the next world. And I had a fr friend in Richmond who uh, uh, drilled a shell out and he broke through and uh, he soaked it for four days. And uh, then he inserted it back in the drill press to go into the little tin cylinder 
inside the projectile where the powder was. And the first turn of the drill, it blew up. And uh, Sam was holding the projectile in his left hand. It blew off these three fingers and uh, blew a fragment through his chest and missed his heart and blew the fuse into his son's chest, uh, who was standing on the other side of the drill press. But they both survived. But uh, Sam has sort of gotten gotten out of the relic business. I write him and he doesn't even answer my letters anymore. <laughs> As we go into it here what a little bit. What would happen if that blew up? <laughs> well, Can I leave while we... <laughs> Jesus. This, uh, Wait a minute. I don't think we'd know anything about it. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Asking questions, Chris. <laughs> Sounds odd. You won't mind. Right now I'm into the powder chamber, um, so you see that uh, everything. Uh, where's everybody all of a sudden? <laughs> but see, we had nothing to worry about at all in this one. See, this goes all the way in. This way, all the way into the powder chamber, and it's all. All we got to do is fill it up with water and we're perfectly safe now. Nobody has to worry well, about this one anymore. <laughs> we safe now? Oh yeah, we safe. Y'all oh. can come back. <laughs> I, never saw, I never saw anybody hit it. I never like saw cameramen right? evaporate so fast. <laughs> but um, all I'm doing well, why now... Why don't we fill it up with water before we do this, uh, Tom? Well, um... It seems to be. <laughs> I've never been so scared. Mike. Sort of wet. Now let's see. We'll get some of the powder to come out of it here in a minute. We put a little water in here to dampen it down a little bit. And uh, now, if it, this were a percussion fuse, I wouldn't think about going into it. Uh, but this was this was most likely a wooden time fuse plug. And so that gives us no problems whatsoever. Famous last word. <laughs> Is there powder in that shell? Well, I'm trying to enlarge the hole enough to find... Yeah, darn right powder's in the shell. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, see that black? That's black powder, but it's wet. And that's as good as the... Uh that's as good as it was back about a hundred years ago. Yeah, it? If it, it, when you dry it out, it's just as good. Now, in a few minutes, I'll show you some dry powder that we got out of a shell the same place this one came from, and we put a match to it, and we'll see what happens. The first night that I thought maybe this might be an interesting hobby for me, a boy did this for me, and he lit the side of the paper bag like this and when it when the flame got up to the uh, powder nothing happened and he started pouring the powder from the bag onto the flame and all of a sudden the whole thing caught and uh, it came right up the powder train and blew the set off the bag in his hand so and it burned all the skin off of his hand so it will go, which you'll see a in a minute as soon as this fire burns up to it. In fact, we light it on both ends here to, to be sure that it burns. And it'll start sparking before it goes, just a little bit. Now, see the white smoke? See all this white smoke? This is what happens why the artillery during the Civil War couldn't hide themselves. This black powder lets off a tremendous amount of white smoke. But you can see it really goes. I, I do worry about it some because if this house caught on fire, uh, it, it could do a lot of damage around the neighborhood. You'd, see, you'd, you'd hear the last shots fired during the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs>